Hello, I'm Boyce Lancaster, and uh, with me is Donna Conady, and we are not at the front of the Southern Theater. We are having a Coda at Home conversation, as we've been doing with a number of the musicians from Pro Music at Chamber Orchestra over the last several weeks. Greetings, Donna. Thanks for taking some time for me. Hey, it's good to be with you, Boyce. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a beautiful day here, and you're in San Diego, where every day is beautiful. It is the I think our high today is going to be seventy two. Excellent, it always is. Yeah, but you've been out there for a few years now. Uh, what took you out to San Diego? Let's go ahead and get a little background on uh, what you're doing. Sure. Um, as you know, I was in Ohio for quite a long time. I was a faculty member at Ohio University in Athens, and I gone into some administrative responsibilities there. And my husband is a native Californian, and he wanted to move back to California if at all possible. And I uh, got a job as director of the School of Music and Dance at San Diego State and uh, did that for about six years. And now I'm um, the associate dean of the college in which that that school is housed. So that worked out well for everybody. Yeah, I think so. And unlike uh, a number of your colleagues I've spoken with thus far, you're not actively teaching at the moment. Most of your duties, in fact, all of them apparently are administratively based. That's correct. Um, have you thought at this point about maybe doing any virtual teaching? There's a lot of that going on. Mm -hmm. Not the easiest thing in the world to do, but maybe it has entered your mind. It has for a long time. I... Um back, gosh, when I first arrived here, I was really interested in, in a platform called Internet 2. And mm -hmm. so we actually established a lab in, in the School of Music um, building to, to enable that. And it's a very, it's like a, a massive super highway, uh, very high bandwidth, very uh, high speed internet, and it allows for real time uh, music interaction. Unfortunately, you have to have everybody connected to it at the same time in order for it to work. So oh. it's still, you know, delivering lessons that way, it, it, it wouldn't serve the needs of the entire school. But I have thought about it. Um, I just, you know, I'm very busy as an administrator, and then I, I like to focus my oboe uh, self, that part of my soul and my identity. I, I prefer to, to, to spend the time with that as a, as a performer right now. And that is something that's rather difficult to do at the moment, what with all that's going on. And I wondered how your musical side is dealing with the inability to really be out and performing and, and taking music to the public. Yeah, it is. It's 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 a different situation. Um, I'm accustomed to having spells in between when I perform actively, uh, just by the nature of how much performing I do and the work that I do. But everything in San Diego is closed up as it is in Columbus. Um, but I've been finding a certain amount of solace, I guess, if you will, and a certain amount of inspiration out of just practicing some Bach and uh, learning some pieces that I've never played before. I was just chatting with uh, Katie McLinn over the weekend, telling her I was trying to learn a, a movement or two out of a, 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 the B minor uh, violin solo partita. And uh, so I was able to get some really in good information from her about how that piece is structured because we don't have all the double stops. <laughs> no. <laughs> Haven't figured out how to do that on the oboe. But yeah, it's just the other thing I'm doing is I'm listening a lot to repertoire and I'm really just because I'm, I'm at home and I'm at, in front of my computer all day working. And um, so I'm, I'm really listening to a lot of different pieces of music. Um, I'm sharing actually some playlists and pieces that really strike me with a friend who's a vice president here at the university. Um, she's got very, very significant burdens in decision making and what have you for resources with the campus. And so I, from time to time, will find something interesting and I just send it to her. So sharing music that way is, is one way that I'm kind of helping reach out, I guess, to get other people through the pandemic. The go-to composer has been Bach with everybody I've spoken to. What mm -hmm. is it about Bach that is that is speaking to you in the midst of this? I've always found Bach to be that composer that stretches uh, me as a musician. It's, it, he's, his music is not easy. It's also very um, introspective. And he lived a rather isolated life, frankly. He didn't travel about widely, and and he um, he really was a very pious man as a as a as a person. And I think that there's something about the, the both the vocabulary of his music and just the soulfulness of it that is really appealing to musicians because you can just keep playing it again and again and again and find something really 
there's a lot there to mine. It's very rich. And this also, as you're working on the Bach and some of your other repertoire, you, gives you an opportunity to spend some really quality one-on-one -on -one time with a, a new addition to your household that mm -hmm. you were mentioning earlier. Oh, that's true. Yes, I, I, I took a leap, kind of a leap of faith, I guess, that we will be back on stage. And I had the opportunity to get a new oboe. And, and this is a, a maker, an American maker. And typically there's about a 10 to 12 year waiting list. His name is wow. Tom Baker. And um, the fellow I knew that was, was selling it, he had just received it and he just, he needed to sell it. So I was able to purchase it, but it's, it's a gorgeous instrument. Um, I'm still getting to know it. And who knows? I mean, usually you buy an oboe or an instrument and you try out a few of them and you go with your friends to a stage and you do a blind test and to have them respond to which instrument they thought sounded best. You do all of that mm -hmm. before you take the plunge. And in this case, it really was a matter of, of getting it shipped to me, trying it out for a week and just saying, OK, I'm going to go with this. And hopefully I'll be able to test it out on the stage of the Southern in the near future. What are you finding with this instrument that is different or maybe it has more flexibility, maybe it has a, a different, I'm sure it has a different voice. What is it about this one that you might find more inviting to play on the stage? Um, you know, I, it's, it doesn't feel drastically different than my uh, one of my Lorrays that I've used for the last couple of years, but it has a there's a silkiness about the way that the key mechanisms work that I like, and the pitch center and uh, intonation on it is is better, and um, it just feels good under the hand, and it's a little bit lighter. The wood that it's made out of is called cocos wood, mm -hmm. and which is now, uh, sadly, it's commercially extinct, but this piece was harvested probably back in the early to mid-60s, somewhere in there. Wow. And um, the log, the, the pieces were sent to this maker, and he fashioned, he has enough to make, I think, three oboes, and this is one of them. Um, it's probably one of only three oboes in the world right now that's made out of this wood. Um, and it's it's just a it's just a gorgeous. I don't know if I can bring it up to the camera and just oh, kind of that. show beautiful. it. It's just a really lovely piece of of wood, museum quality and gold posts and and what have you. It's just, but it's lighter actually. It's very mm. dense wood, but it's lighter than the the typical African blackwood or grenadilla that oboes are made out of. So for me, it it feels a little bit better on my on my wrist, just as we. As we get more mature, our wrists start to do things that we don't like them to do, don't they? <laughs> exactly. I was going to ask you if that wood um, is, since it's commercially extinct, do you have any difficulties in travels or if you have to take it out of the country? Are there papers you have to take? It's actually not on the list. I know the one that you're referring to, but it's not on the list for uh, materials that are illegal to, to, to transport and to travel with. I, I wouldn't want to test it really, to be honest with you. I would probably take my Luray, the, the, the more standard uh, wood, and just to be on the safe side. Wow. If I were traveling internationally with it, with an well, old Well, this certainly, this whole situation here, the whole pandemic has really tested the sanity of some of us and mm -hmm. the ability to find things to do at home. And uh, as I was speaking with Janet, we were looking at what performance might look like down the road. Do you see as an administrator and you're working with, uh, with a music school, how do you begin to work with students at this point who are saying, am I even going to have a music career on the other side of this? Are there things that you're having to completely rethink? Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, there are things in, in history and we're living that moment right now in human history where uh, technology has advanced to a certain point and it enables a lot of things, but it also doesn't enable everything that we, we have always been accustomed to. And one of those is of course, live music performance. Um, I think what I've been working with, because we're really working very hard in, on my campus as all universities are right now to figure out how are we going to deliver the curriculum in the fall. And the, the Cal State system has announced that it was going to be largely virtual. Uh, we've applied for exceptions so that we can teach music lessons and we can teach orchestra and we can teach various courses that, that require 
uh, I mean, we make, as musicians, we make the air vibrate. We make the room vibrate and we mm -hmm. make uh, every, anybody who's in the room vibrates um, with the sound. And so it's, it's something that it, that's a key part of the training for a, a young musician to have is working with, with an ensemble. We have the same problem with the art students. They are ceramicists or, or whatever their, their, their case might be, or theatrical students who are making costumes or doing lighting design. They need to be able to access the spaces in which they, they do that work. Um, but the message that I've tried to have with faculty as we've been discussing this is that we have to plan for the eventuality that we may have to go virtual if we're not approved for these exceptions or uh, the pandemic may raise its head again and, and we have a second or a third wave and we may have to shut down very suddenly as we did in March. Um, but the most important message I think is that we have to rethink and reimagine what the future is now going to be in light of what we've just experienced and what we're currently experiencing. It's going to be different. It's not going to be the same ever again. We're not going back to, to how it used to be. Um, I think we are absolutely going to have live performances again. Um, we may have to think of audience and spacing differently in, in the near term, and hopefully very soon we'll have a vaccine. But until that happens or until the pandemic uh, just completely abates and the coronavirus is basically vanquished, um, you know, we're going to have to do things differently. A lot of chamber music, I suspect. I suspect so. Um, do you, in the midst of all of this, and as you've been thinking about these things, is there any silver lining for you that you might see on the horizon in the midst of this? I think that people are going to want art more than ever. And I think that the pandemic has certainly um, illustrated that. that anytime there's a, 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 an event that is so hard to understand and so hard to grasp the enormity of it. And when you think about American lives lost and the lives lost across the world, you think about the fear that all of us are living with that. What if, you know, how, how can I stay safe? Um, we are all living in that together. And the arts, we may not speak you know, as, as an orchestra, we don't maybe use the words to explain, but if you sit and listen to a piece of music or, you know, say Bach or say a modern composer, they're reflecting what it is to be a human being at that point in time. And what we find through that exploration is that it's there's this consistent seeking and this consistent trying to grasp with difficulties. Um, there were pandemics in box time. There were diseases in box time. That Then there was that fear, that continuous fear and that weight yeah. hanging over. So I think now more than ever, for sure, I think people are going to come to chambers of, of orchestra halls and they're going to sit and they're going to listen and they're going to feel that sense of community and, and commonality with history. So maybe it will eventually work to pull us back together and uh, give us a little comfort in very, mm -hmm. very difficult and unsettled times. Absolutely. Absolutely. Donna, Donna, I, Donna Connedy is the principal oboe for Music at Chamber Orchestra. It's always a pleasure to hear you play, and it's been a pleasure to share a few minutes speaking with you uh, out in San Diego. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, boys. It was good chatting with you. Yes. Look forward to seeing you at the Southern. Yes, again, please. All right. Bye, everybody.